Bound Club. There's that new American Vandal on, isn't there? I just got a thing from Netflix today saying, hey, this is available. So at first, I thought it was a bit like Making a Murderer. Yeah. And I was thinking, the fucking hell, this is really good. But then I realised it was a mockumentary and I should have realised earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us for another episode of Film Club. <laughs> uh, I'm one of your hosts, Andy Harrison, to my right, as always, it's Andy Dawson. Hello. We are here, Andy, for episode 50. 50. What have we been watching this week? Well, it's a quite special one because it's a film I've been ne- meaning to watch for a while. And probably the same with him. Have you seen it before? Oh, I've seen this before. Oh, I, I love it. Blade Runner. Blade Runner. Oh, you know. Blade Runner. Every single week in Film Club, we invite you along to watch a film. And this week, it's Blade Runner. We're going to dive into a little bit of the history of cinema and figure out whether or not... I was about to say I'm going to figure out whether or not Blade Runner still holds up. Is that even a question? So, Andy, give us a rundown. What's a Blade Runner about? What's a Blade Runner about? What is a Blade Runner and what does a Blade Runner do in the world of Blade Runner? Um, post-apocalyptic, not post-apocalyptic, uh, it's a dystopian future. I just love that phrase, post-apocalyptic dystopian future. It's a dystopian future um, where life has come off Earth and it's gone to other planets and inhabit other planets. And they made life by robots called replicants. Now, a replicant is someone who completely, not necessarily completely, but the replicants portrayed in this film are the ones that completely uh, physically look like a human and in some cases think like a human but they're actually a robot and there's certain traits that tell them apart. Um, Due to a few, I think replicants killed a few humans, they're not being allowed on Earth. It does look very crowded. And um, it's about uh, any replicant goes on Earth, gets killed, or as they like to call it, retired. And that is done by what's called a Blade Runner, hence the name of the film. A Blade Runner is a person who actively seeks out replicants and kills them, which is what Harrison Ford is in this film, Decker. So we should just preface this a little bit, because... If you caught last week's episode, we mentioned that the version of the film that we're reviewing is the final cut. Yeah, the final cut, which is part of Ridley Scott's. Even though my mate was telling me, it doesn't feel like it's still completed, but the final cut seems to be the most complete version to date. Yeah, it's the one that Ridley Scott, like, he considers it the definitive version, so we thought we'd go for that. It's the most recent cut to have been done. Uh, So for anyone who is interested, there has been, I want to say, three major cuts. Uh, yeah, it's probably um, three major. I think there's seven or eight. Because there's there's bit, so what happened was when Ridley Scott originally made this back in 1983, was that right? Um, he had a version of the 82. film basically ready to go. 82. A version of the film basically ready to go, and then studios decided they were going to put a voiceover over the top of uh, some bits with Harrison Ford. Do you know how cool about that? He was not happy about gone. Harrison Ford wasn't happy. Ridley Scott wasn't happy. So Harrison Ford did the whole voiceover in a monotonous tone. Yeah, have you heard it? No. It's horrible. Is it? Yeah, it's really bad. So eventually, Ridley Scott was given the chance to do a director's cut, which he did, remove the voiceover, changed some little bits and pieces, and then finally went back to this in 2004, 2007, one of the two, and did his final cut. Which I believe includes a few scenes, most notably the unicorn scene where Deckard's dreaming. Yes. So while we're on the subject of the unicorn, let's talk about the unicorn scene. How do you feel about it being put back into the film? Well, I guess for you, seeing it for the first time, how do you feel about being there? Um, <laughs> so this is something I thought we were going to approach towards the end of the review, um, which is the whole... Shouldn't have brought it up then, should you? Dickhead. Um, <laughs> no, it's, it's all about like... So, so the reason Blade Runner is like Notorious is not only is it great sci-fi, it has great music, great sound, great lighting, just a great fucking... To be honest, great acting as well. All around, it's story, it's, it's, it's all around a fucking fantastic film. Uh, I've heard so much about it to actually see it. it it's kind of like, yeah, yeah you're, you're all right about watching this. But one of the main things as well is it makes you question. Um, and one of the things that makes you question is two things. Um, the first one that comes to mind, as everyone knows who's seen it, is whether or not Deckard is actually a replicant or is human. It questions what's the difference. Um, secondly, kind of like moving on from that, it questions what is humanity? What defines humanity? And it questions you, the audience. It's what's amazing about this film. It's what I thought, fuck yeah, that's fucking awesome, that man. So the unicorn scene, it speaks to me personally, subjective, of course. Because you love unicorns. <laughs> The unicorns aren't real, of course. Um, part of this film is the replicants have dreams put into them, programmed into them. Um, so you don't know what's real, you don't know what memories are real. The unicorn senior wakes up, um, the argument, go on, Duncan coming into a fucking force here, good man. The argument is Deckard having these dreams, you know, like maybe they're programmed inside of him. Maybe, you know, he, Deckard himself, it's portrayed as the unicorn scene takes up the whole screen. Then Deckard wakes up, it's portrayed that he has it. I like to think a bit more than that. So, 
we could go on about like whether or not Tekken's a replicant. But I like to think like going on my second point where it speaks to the audience. You know what? What is humanity? Can I come down here? We're jumping straight into the fucking deep end. Yeah. Here. Before you move off the replicant as replicant thing. Yeah. Um, do you know the answer that Ridley Scott has given? Yes, he's a replicant. Yes, I can't really, Scott. He's a replicant. Uh, for anyone at home who doesn't know, like Andy said, one of the additions is the unicorn scene, which means that in the original cut, the unicorn scene wasn't there. And essentially, there is no question in the original cut as to whether he's a replicant. He just isn't, which means that this is a lovely addition, which adds ambiguity to the yeah, whole thing. Yeah, it makes it so ambiguous. And it just, it just deepens the film a bit more. Usually. So, go on, your second point. <laughs> I've got a note here that says Deckard, human or replicant except instead of Deckard autocorrect has gone into uh, declared nice um, so yes yeah, so let's go on about like what is humanity so in this film there's two things that it, it, it shows uh, the definition between humanity and replicant a human and replicant is empathy and creativity so let me expand on that so the replicants show empathy so what you see is who's the main gaffer the main buddy the antagonist oh I can't remember his name the, oh he's Dutch is he Dutch? Well, I don't, do you know what? He's either Dutch or I just made a very racist comment is because it Rutger, he looks Dutch. Rutger Hauer as Roy? Yes, there we go, Roy. Is he Dutch? Is he Dutch? Come on. Uh, he's Dutch, well played. Well, I'll give, I'll give you a handshake there. Thank you. So, so what he does um, is he, he has a love for, is it Pish? Pris? Pris? Pris. Yep, and you know, he says, oh, there's only two of us left. So there's his empathy. There's his like, you know, I really care about these people. I, I don't want to go at the end when he saves Deckard's life. If Deckard truly is a replicant, he doesn't want another replicant to go. Even though this replicant is a Blade Runner, it's a bit uh, ironic, if anything. Um, but the fact of the matter is, um, there's other empathy as well. There's um, Rachel. Rachel, yeah. The, 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 when, when the replicant who doesn't know she's a replicant. She, she, she cries at finding out she is, that Deckard's initial um, fuck off sort of thing. And then she, you know, she, they love each other and stuff like that. That's empathy going from a replicant. To contrast this, look at what you have in terms of. Excuse me. Uh, empathy. Um, Deckard's the main example. And yes, I'm using Deckard loosely. He's the one that's supposed to be a human. But he, he shoots that first woman, doesn't he? Without any remorse like that. It's just bang, she's dead. I want there to kill you. No questions asked. You're there. It's the same with the guy at the interview. Right, me who the first woman is? Uh, I can't remember. She's one that's running away and she's got the tower on the snake woman. Oh, right. Okay. Actually, well, do you know what? To be fair, to emphasise your idea a little bit of the empathy thing, I think he does kind of empathise. I think he feels when he kills that woman. And actually, if we take one of the, one of the earliest kind of 100% human characters who turns up in the film, which I'm thinking of uh, Deckard's boss who brings him back in. Yeah, yeah. He's okay. got no empathy. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So Deckard's a bit of a thing. But yeah, and he was my next one. I was going to go into it. Thank you very much. He's just like, oh, fuck it. Yeah, like this. And the humans show no empathy, whereas the replicants do. So onto the other part, creativity. Shit, let me get back to my notes. So creativity, the replicants show creativity by, uh, for example, Rachel, when she plays piano. Yes, it might be an embedded in, she, does. she goes, I don't know if I know this tune because it's been put into my system. She chooses to play at that time when he's asleep and it makes a really nice mo emotional moment for the film, yeah. which later goes into a love scene, right? You've got the other part of creativity where you've got Roy, uh, you know, that amazing speech at the end. Yeah, which teasing the rain. Which is ironic because the actual actor is human and he improvised it, so that shows his creativity. Get away from the actual um, inside of the actual the behind the production. The, the Roy made that, and it's amazing. It's a nice bit of almost poetic, isn't it? It's really poetic. Oh, yeah, yeah. And to see something, probably the most poetic dialogue to come again from a replicant. Exactly. So to contrast that, you go back to the humanity. Look at that guy who's not the... Well, you've got the boss guy, the big, big boss. Not the boss, the creator, the big creator. He and the other guy, the nerdy creator, you know, is all his mates are robots, right? And those two converse to each other through chess. Chess is a notoriously logic and uh, mathematical way to speak to someone using chess is a very anti-creative, it's a very logical way of going, you know, going with someone. It says humanity and replicants contrasting what they should, they should be, really. Yeah. And so it's moving beyond is decade a replicant or a human, it's questioning what is humanity, because in the end, if these can make robots appear more human, at least in this, our perception of the film, appear more human, then fuck it. Yeah. Humanity needs to be redefined. Thematically, the film is just a masterpiece. And it sounds almost cliche to say that at this point, but it is thematically and in terms of the story, the film is an utter masterpiece. But I also think it's a masterpiece in terms of its production. Hugely. And one of the things I agree. that yeah. will always, like, as soon as I watch that watching the film, which punches me in the face, the intro is oh. the look of the film. Yeah. The look of this film is absolutely incredible. Blues. What, sorry? Blues. Or the use of blue. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of kind of that in here. Um, so the cinematographer is a guy called... 
Jordan Cronenworth. And hats off to you, Mr. Cronenworth, because this film is one of the most beautiful pieces of film ever constructed. I think it's a marriage between him and Ridley Scott. Ridley Scott, especially in this era, Ridley Scott at the time was coming off of Alien. Yeah. So he'd just done Alien, um, and this is right before he did, what was that? Oh, God, what was that really weird film he did after this? It's got, like, a terrible sort of production quality to it, and this weird devil that turns up. Shriek. Is it called Legion? Shriek. Not Shriek. <laughs> so anyway, um, he had this, like, back-to-back -back hit of, like, Alien Blade Runner. And in this... Uh, he makes some of the most iconic imagery ever. You might not have seen, ever seen Blade Runner, but you'll recognise some of the imagery that he's using. That last scene with the tears. Tears in the rain. The neon with the Chinese. You know, yeah, the, a lot of like this cups. dark silhouetted stuff. He's using a lot of like inspiration from things like film noirs. Yeah. In, in terms of not only um, the style of it, like there's use of literally high contrasty colours and shadows and light. There's Venetian blinds going on, but also your main your main character is a like... Grim, grizzled detective. Is the so. Venetian blind part, you know, when uh, Roy's good and the elevator just after he's killed his father almost, mm. and it's shining on him and his light's shining on him, is that a Venetian blind effect? I can't, I don't quite remember what scene you're talking about. But come Venetian, down there. Yeah, you'll see yeah. it down here, and then I'll put what a Venetian blind effect definitely is down here as well. Cool. Uh, it's basically like light coming through lines that go across like that. Yeah, that's what it is, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, so he's got his heavy inspiration from film noir. He also has his big inspiration from, this reminds me of films like um, the original Star Wars trilogy. I mean, I was going to say this. this. I was going to say this. I was just thinking there. Should I mention it? Um, Attack of the Clones when Obi Wan goes to kill Sam Wessel. Should I mention that little scene? Because that's like the fucking. It's almost like. Oh, no, I'm talking about the original Star Wars trilogy. Oh right. Okay. Well, I didn't really want to mention Attack of the Clones <laughs> because it's like my least favorite Star oh, yeah. Wars. It's like Attack. But so here's the thing, right? I'm talking about in terms of production, the way things are made, very practical. This whole world, for the most part, is practical. Yeah. And you know, what? I've always had this like thing. I've always had this bug that. I, I rag on modern cinema, like, a lot. Like, I often think maybe it's my fault. Maybe maybe I'm being too hypercritical of modern cinema. Do you know what? Then I started watching this. No, I am not being too critical of modern cinema. People are not making films like this anymore. People just aren't making films like this. This film feels so real. This film feels so believable, even though its concept it's future. is so high. Yeah. And the future, yeah. So like you're talking about there with episode two of Star Wars, they were, like this film would eventually go on to uh, influence a whole bunch of, of sci-fi films, one of them being that Star Wars film. Yeah. And we would be remiss not to mention the fact that Ridley Scott has cited on many occasions that his inspiration for like the, the, uh, the look of the city in Blade Runner is from Teesside. Our hometown. Yeah, it's from it's from where we're from. It's from uh, looking always, out at some of these, these bank, industrial. Always with bank, and you're going down. You got ICI on the right with the yeah. flame going up. He sees the flames at the start of the film. You see Albany at night, and you got the city lights expanding all the way to the um, transporter bridge. That yeah. is that is going down Almsby Bank, and that's apparently that's what again what Duncan said. Well, you did that uh, drive. We went down the bypass. We go down Almsby Bank into the uni. And it was like, look, this, this, there, when you do this scene again at night and watch the intro at Blade Runner, I was like, fuck it. It's out. beautiful. He takes his approach with, um, so yeah, it, he takes, done, he takes his approach done. as like, really he doesn't look at, at the future as being utopian. Like I said, it's dystopian. dystopian. Instead, he reflects that in, in the architecture as well. This feels, it reminds you of things. Have you seen Brazil from Terry Gilliam? I'm pretty sure Brazil came out after this. So again, Brazil <clears> probably took some inspiration from this. Um, but this is a world where things are, they're chunky, they're industrial. Um, everything has a tactile quality, even like the flying ships. Bear in mind, flying, flying cars exist alongside regular cars because that's how things would work when flying cars start turning up. And even those, like, they don't just nicely hover away with like, instead they let out large amounts of steam and like they're relatively loud and like they're not pleasant to have around, but people are using them anyway. It's got a huge industrial aspect to it. Yep. So. Just from a production standpoint, the film is just like mouthwateringly amazing. I just wish people made films like this still. Mo uh, not moving on, in let's talk about production as well. Sandy's on about the visual side of production, the audio side of production. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God, the music in this. No. So the music's done by a guy at uh, Greek, I believe. Let me just double check, called Vangelis. Incredible. Yeah. The use of ambience, the use of uh, synthesizers to, to create that sound, to create that soundtrack. Is is absolutely mesmerizing. You know, you got the main theme. You got you got all these like incredibly like droneish almost synths coming in. Then you have to all coming together, and fucking hell, what blew me over? 
Um, let me just go back to La Note because uh, it's in there. Um, in the scene where the snake woman gets shot, yeah, there's a huge, 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 like where what a saxophone should be in the background. It's made with synth. Do you know it's like really, 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 it's like noir music recreated by synth in the 80s kind of stuff. It's like a futuristic noir. That's, That's impressive. Exactly what he was That's going for. That's impressive. Yeah. So I, I was very, I, I loved that. Uh, Vangelis, let me just double check. I, I really feel bad. Yeah, he's Greek, thank God. Um, cool. And then you've got the other aspect, which is the sound effects. Yeah. Now the sound effects are amazing as well. And there's one scene that really caught me and I was just like, fuck yeah, that's cool. So you've got everything happening around you. It's, it is quite a loud film. Yeah. The robot scene, you've got all these robots going around making all these sounds. Um, just throughout the film, like you said, you've got the cars making sounds, everything thing. Uh, everything's loud. And Which really... is funny because like, in terms of dialogue, it's quite a quiet film. It is? Yeah, I, I love that, don't I? I love yeah. the dialogue. <laughs> Which is weird. There's a really good scene that I really enjoy and it's when he's outside. I think it's when he's looking for, it is, it's when you're looking for Snake Woman. It's a really good scene, that. It's a really good scene. It's like one of my favourites of the film. Yeah. Um, is... Have you ever, side note, have you ever seen the, the Red Dwarf parody of that? I don't watch Red Dwarf. Oh, it's funny. They've got this entire episode, like entire season practically that parodies uh, Blade Runner and they do the whole like death thing with smashing through the glass. Yeah, there was, there was yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, um, there's, there's that scene and he, he got the uh, traffic lights and he goes, he goes, cross now. Yeah. Cross now and don't walk like that. And that's always going on in the background. He's looking around for, for whatever his name is, Snake Woman. And you just hear in the background, you hear all this commotion, these busybodies going around. Uh, when he's at the, in the noodles, everything's happening around you. It just makes, it, it's, what's the word? It immerses you in the environment. Again, considering it's a futuristic film, it feels so real. Yeah. It's incredibly well done. So music, sound effects, production, lights, everything was on point. Every so often, we like to bring up a, a, the odd game, and every so often we pull it back to Fallout 4 all the time. Yeah. Did you get the, the Fallout 4 noodle vibe? Yes, yes, yeah. yes, 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 yes. And I assume it's in my scar. Oh, car. right. That's like Oh, no, yeah, yeah, never thought about that. That's the whole thing. Like, you know, there's, there's the backstory about uh, a synth, yeah. uh, sorry, uh, a replicant going in oh. and killing people. That's, that's what they're parodying in Fallout 4 when you have the noodle bar and the synth. Just starts killing people. Bethesda, nice one. Well played. <laughs> Did something good instead of recreating a Skyrim for like the tenth time. Harsh. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I, like, I like Bethesda. Um, so yeah, the film catches what I love about this thing. I think catches Ridley Scott at arguably the height of his career. It catches uh, Harrison Ford arguably at the height of his career. This is like in between Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. Is that right? And it's either, it's either right before he does Indiana Jones or it's right after he's just done the first Indiana Jones. It's great to see Harrison Ford, not as this charismatic kind of character. He's very yep. laid back. He's very relaxed. He's very quiet. Very quiet. He doesn't have that kind of snark about him. Yes, the snark's um, a good word. And yeah. if anything, when it comes down like to fight, he's actually not that great. No, he's he like running away and stuff. He gets his kicked. He's really yeah. worried a lot of the time and just wonderful. And to contrast him, you've got Rutger Hauer, who's yeah. just impeccable. He's, he's, he, he exerts confidence. He kind of dominates the fight that he's in. He's very... I love that animalistic nature he does towards the end of the film. I was about to say that. Very like, animalistic. That, that's incredible. And yeah. again, going on about replicants, not necessarily being human, but not showing traits of being a robot. I mean, that's like... It's weird. He's doing that wolf howl. It's, it's, it's weird, but it's barbaric. Yeah. Which again, barbaric comes down to humanity and stuff like that. It's, yeah. it's, it's amazing. It is. It is. And, and then... Sean Young. Um, the film has, for a reason, stood the test of time. It's been recut for many good reasons. It's had multiple theatrical releases. And if I had to pick probably a film that I regret never having the chance to see in a cinema, yeah, Blade this Runner, might be the top of the list. I don't know, maybe not the top. Star Wars. Star Wars. Ooh. Yeah, it's top five. It's going to go in the top five somewhere. Um, so, there's Blade Runner. I can't wait for the new one. And Ryan Andy, Gosling as well. That is episode 51. No. 50. Episode 50. Sorry, I don't know why I got 51. Coming to our bloody anniversary soon, like. Yeah. So that's episode 50. We're halfway to 100. We are coming up on a one-year anniversary in like two weeks, which we have a special episode planned, so you can stay tuned for it. You can hit us up on Twitter if you want to let us know what you thought of Blade Runner, or you can let us know in the comments below as well. Uh, just like always, we'll be back once again next week to do X Machina. Thank you very much for joining us, guys. We'll see you next week. Do I do another wipe? No, I'm so done. <laughs>